Legacy Active Church. Let's give the Lord the biggest shout of praise. Amen. Come on, let's really give a big shout of praise. Amen. Amen. So um, we're going to pray together and then we're going to get into the word. So I'm going to ask you to put your right hand in your heart. Repeat after me. Say, Lord God. And, and Lord Jesus. I ask you to speak to my life. I ask that you'd minister to my heart. <clears throat> May your word be revealed to me today in a way that I can understand it, so that I can speak it and do it and see it change my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just to let you know, Pastor Bert's in the Philippines at the moment, and uh, incredible things are happening there. And uh, an incredible word this morning that we're going to be listening to from from Pastor Shane. So can we just give a huge round of applause? Amen. Amen. And I promise you now you're going to enjoy this. Tell your neighbor, listen, you're going to enjoy this. I mean, let's just get into it. Thanks. We want to greet everybody who's watching online. If you're on DSTV, How TV this morning, also for all of our Impact Radio listeners, and then for our streaming campuses. We're going to put our hands together, Centurion, for Paula Kwane, Alberton, Soshanguvi, 3C Active, Pretoria West, Nigel, and Ivory Park. And turn to the person next to you, say good morning, and it's so good, and... Beautiful day in the presence of the Lord. And uh, I know that God is going to do an incredible work within our lives. Uh, Ama Boka, Boka. Oh, we are celebrating as a nation today. And we're so excited that uh, our team now are the second uh, consecutive rugby world champions and we have conquered and uh, we are so excited to celebrate with our rugby champions today and we are uh, I'm, I'm so lost night I don't even know what to say I just had to stuff a lot of biltong into my mouth the whole time because my daughters were watching with me, Pastor Bert and Damien are on their way uh, back from Philippines. They were ministering there at an incredible conference with Pastor Cesar and Pastor uh, Bishop Ariel. And so they were there. And uh, usually I think I watch the sport because of my husband, but last night was just on level. So me and the girls and Tristan were, were watching. And um, what can we say about the French supporters? You know, I just had to put stuff in my mouth because I had a few things to say say to them when they booing my captain and nah. anyway in their face we won so praise <laughs> I, I don't know praise Jesus all I know is Madison was praying in tongues for the spring box <laughs> that was so funny oh my goodness she got up when it got tense and she was pacing next to the bed and I was like Lord I don't know if I should tell her to to not do it, or do we do it, or I don't know, but if you can use it, Lord, use it, <laughs> and so it was precious, and a, and a great night for us as a nation, but at the end of it all, we know that Jesus is the only answer, that the kingdom of heaven is what we need to invade our nation, for us to have you know, the, the elation, the joy that we experience, for it to be uh, sustained, Hello, we can't have a World Cup victory every weekend for us to live in that place of unity and harmony. No, we need something sustainable. And this only comes to a nation through the working of the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ. We're gonna pray together over the word today that the word will challenge us, it always does, but much more than that, that the word will transform us. Do you wanna change today? Amen. Amen. And that is the promise of God, that the word is like a two-edged sword that discerns within us what is, what is of God, what isn't, and it has the power to transform us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So Father, we come before you in humility. We come before you in surrender. We come before you asking that your word today will not be the word of a woman or an institution, but truly that the word of God will come alive in the hearts of everyone under my voice in Jesus' name. And that your Holy Spirit will pen it on us, in it, and transform us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Father, we need you in the 
this nation. We need your Holy Spirit in this nation. We cannot change anything. We can't even change ourselves, but we know that whatever God does is forever. And so we look to you for an eternal change and transformation beginning in us in Jesus' name. Amen and Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. And I want to take you, um, we're going to look at a prophetic word today. Uh, we're going to start in the book of John, then we're going to go back to the Old Testament. And, you know, oftentimes I've heard people say this, which makes no sense to me. So that's all Old Testament. The word of God is the word of God. Are you with me? And, you know, it is the only book ever, the only book that does not age, which means it is as relevant now as it was on the day that it was written. Many others have written many great works, and some of us are uh, taught some of these works at school, right? If you're at school, you've had to study Shakespeare, yes? But we don't speak like that, do we? <laughs> That's not how we talk to one another. It's, it's for some of us something that we only ever will pick up because we have to. Are you with me? Because things have aged, things have changed. That's not our culture. That's not our modern day lives anymore. But when it comes to the word of God, I want you to hear me today. The word of God is ageless. The word of God is relevant here and now. If it is in the word, let me tell you, it's not coincidence, right? God is genius. God is on levels um, of planning and construct and putting things together that we can only glimpse here and there the fullness of the glory of the one who put together the word for us. So please don't shut your mind and walk away today saying, oh, it's so Old Testament. <laughs> no, it's so relevant, it's so now, it's so here, it's so necessary, it's so the word of God, hallelujah. But we're gonna take our key verse from John chapter 19 and verse 34, and I wanna show you the significance of the scripture. Again, if you just read the Bible without the Holy Spirit, things will be lost for you. Are you with me? especially because we are not in that culture and not in that day. So there are certain things that we will not lay a hold of to the extent that God wants if we read the word without the Holy Spirit. Just put your hand on your heart and say, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me, Lord, to understand the word, yes. So we're in John chapter 19 and it's at the crucifixion of Jesus. So we all remember that he was not crucified alone, but that on his left and on his right were crucified two other criminals. And he was treated as a criminal. That's why he was crucified. And what was culture in the day was to speed up the process of death, but also to increase the torment of the one crucified. They would break the bones of the people so the legs would be broken so they could not push the body up straight to be able to breathe. Are you with me? So once someone was crucified and they were hanging there for a couple of hours, it was torment, it was torture, it was humiliation, it was all kinds of pain on every single level. Then they would come and they would break the legs of that person on that cross and then they would sag and as their bodies would sag, they would not be able to breathe and many times they suffocated, which is one of the worst deaths that you can possibly die from now the torment of the cross, adding that torment and so people would perish. But you know, that it was prophesied of Jesus that not one bone of his body would be broken. The Romans didn't know this. They didn't study the Torah. The principles, the powers that be did not understand how God works. This is why we can believe the Bible because prophecies are fulfilled every single day. Prophecies have been fulfilled and prophecies will be fulfilled until the return of Jesus. And so this was the prophecy of the Son of God. Now, not knowing the prophetic word, not knowing what was said about the Son of God, 
<coughs> excuse me. There came now thunder and lightning and darkness as he's ready to speak his last words and breathe his last breath. And so the soldiers, in the effort then to hasten the deaths, because they couldn't leave them there alive, broke the bones of the murderer, of the criminal, of the guilty parties on his left and on his right. And they should have done the same to him. And we see in a divine intervention, in a moment of miracle, in a moment of prophecy fulfilled, they brought a spear and they stuck it. Let's read together John 19 verse 34. Are you there? It says, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. What should they have done? They should have broken his bones. But in a fulfillment of prophecy, in a God divine intervened way, they do not touch the bones of Jesus. It was a phenomenon because never before and never after do we read of a crucifixion victim having a spear to their side. God is on the throne. God is in control. God has got you. Hallelujah. And so what the devil thought would add further humiliation to Jesus Christ and extend his pain on the cross in actual fact was a divine weapon in the hand of God as a fulfillment of prophecy. Oh, praise Jesus. I am so grateful today that my God is greater. My God is higher. My God is stronger. My God is never intimidated, nervous, at a loss. Even in the most darkest of moments, we see the hand of God. And now let's read together. It says, and immediately blood and water came out. So as they pierced his side, what happened? Blood and water came out. This is extremely significant. Extremely significant. If the devil knew the significance of this moment, he would have hidden it to us. He would have prevented it. He would have done all that he could. But see, the devil, you know my saying, the devil doesn't know what the devil doesn't know. Are you with me? And so the water and the blood come out separately. Do you know that in the human body, if any of us had a cut right now, we couldn't discern the water and the blood separately. Are you with me? When we bleed, we bleed blood. But... When the heart explodes, when the heart bursts, when the heart, which is the pump, the organ that controls the flow of blood, when it breaks, the pressure of that event will separate your blood and your water that is in the blood, and it will come out separately. Now, this is a fulfillment of a prophetic word. I wanna take you now back into the Old Testament. Let's go back into the book of Ezekiel chapter 47. It says there in verse one, then he brought me back to the door of the temple. Who is Jesus but the temple of God? Are you with me? He's the first temple. We're not talking about a building. We're not talking about a tent. We're not talking about a construct of human hands. We are talking as the first temple indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Remember before Jesus, there was no baptism of the Holy Spirit. Before Jesus, there was no indwelling of the Spirit of God. He might have been with them. He might have been on them, but he couldn't be in them until Jesus came. And so Jesus is our model. Jesus is our example. Jesus is the first. Hallelujah. What is Jesus? He's the First, he's the model, he's the example, he is the blueprint of who we will be. And so when the prophet here, the book of Ezekiel is a prophetic book, and this is a prophetic word today. He says, he brought me to the door of the temple. But now we're not gonna look at the temple as a building. We're gonna look at the temple as the first temple, as Jesus Christ and as the blueprint for us because the Bible now says we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now look what it says. And there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east for the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from the side of the temple. 
the water was flowing from the side of the temple. No one could explain where this water was from because there was no well. There was no underground river. There was no spring. There was no source. If you look at the geography of this prophecy, if you study the area that he is speaking about, there could not be water. The temple wasn't built over a source of water, but as the angel of the Lord, as he takes Ezekiel through this prophetic word, it says from the side of the temple, there is a flow of water. As from the side of Jesus, there was a flow of water, but it's just a little bit, just a little bit. Remember that many would not have been close enough to Jesus to discern the water and the blood separate from his side. His body was covered in blood by that time. He, his hands were nailed. His feet were nailed. He was beaten with that whip 39 times with that claws of metal. It pierced his body and then it pulled his flesh from him. They ripped his beard from his face. Do you understand how much blood there was during the crucifixion? How, how then did someone notice the blood and the water coming separately from the side? Why? Because God is in the detail. God is in the littlest thing. God is the one who spoke centuries before and said, this is how it will be. The son of man before the foundation of the world was slain and water and blood will flow from the side of the temple. Now let's go on and see. It says the water was flowing from the side, divinely sourced. It didn't come from anywhere that we can note. We cannot determine the origin, but to say it is divine, it is miracle, it is supernatural, it is God. And so he brought me out by the way of the north gate, verse two, and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east, and there was water running out on the side. So it wasn't important to see a flow of water from a government building. It wasn't a flow of water from a marketplace or a business. It wasn't a flow of water, as much as we enjoy those, from a sporting or entertaining event or place. But the water flowed from the side of what? Of the, of the temple. The source of all life, the source of all joy, the source of all hope, the source of all peace, the source of all that we need is divinely orchestrated to be God and God alone. And from the temple, it will flow. Amen. Amen. So let's now go on to verse three and see what happens. So we see the source, the origin, the beginning of the flow is divine. Are you with me? Can you see it? Can you see the divineness, the divinity of that moment when the spear goes into Jesus and the water flows and prophecy is fulfilled? There's a divine beginning. There's a divine announcement. Something is about to happen. Something is about to change. Something is about to shift. Something is about to yield to the power of God. And it may just be a little flow. It may hardly be noticeable to some, but let's read what happens. It says, so when the man went out to the east with this line in his hand, a measuring line, it says he measured 1,000 cubits and he brought me through the waters and the water came up to my ankles. This is astonishing because there is no spring, there is no oasis, there is no source, there, is, there, there, there was a little trickle, there was a little flow, it was something small. But as we go 1,000 cubits, that which was hardly noticeable, that which was just a little flow, has increased to cover by my ankles. 
And then it says, he kept on going another thousand cubits and the water came up to my knees. It is impossible. It is unreasonable. It has absolutely no human explanation. It started as what? A little flow. And now it's already reaching ankles and knees. And yet again, he continues another cubits. And the water came up to my waist. And again, he measured 1,000. And it was a river, a river that I couldn't cross. For the water was too deep. I had to swim because the river was so deep that it could not be crossed. I am here to tell you that what seems to be just a trickle, what seems to just be a little flow, what seems to be insignificant, what seems to be something that we can just brush aside is about to begun to begin in our midst and take us ankle deep and take us knee deep and take us waist deep until we have to swim for the depths of the river of God and it is him he's the source he's the beginning he is the origin he is the author he has spoken over that marriage he says hey it, there, there, there's just a trickle there's just a little flow of blessing it, it is hardly there hardly noticeable but I want you to know that there's a prophetic word over that union for we two have become one in the presence of God we two have become one through the unity of the Holy Spirit that will go into a place of flood, into a place of river, into a place of blessing that cannot be explained. It's not your efforts. It's not your trying so very hard to be a good spouse, but it is the pr prophetic provision of God on a God thing that will bring it to pass. And it's the same for every facet of your life. Every area of your life is covered by the blood and covered by the flow of Jesus Christ. For your children, you may see in them just a little trickle. They, they come into church. They, they, they sit through the service. They endure all the crazy that we call Christianity. There's just a little trickle. At least they're not rebellious and refusing to be there. But there's just a trickle. It really isn't a river. But God says, if you can see, if you can see that if I'm in it, if I have begun it, surely it will increase. Surely it will multiply. Surely it will come to pass according to my word. And for so many of us, we have started in the ministry. Oh, my Lord. We have witnessed, we have witnessed, we have witnessed, we have witnessed, we have witnessed. We have done outreach upon outreach, and we have one disciple. Well, Jesus is here to say to you today, if you have a little trickle, if all you have is a little flow, if it's so insignificant that many have not noticed what you are doing for God, he's here to tell you, I see it, I see it, I'm the source of it. And if you remain faithful in the little thing, that little thing will surely multiply into something unstoppable, into something that cannot be contained. Praise Jesus. It is not our doing. It is not our effort. It's the prophetic grace of God upon our lives, but we need to lay a hold of it. How? By faith. We have to believe. And so he says in John 4, he says, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Now, I don't know if you've seen these people. I have a friend like this. Hello, Heather. She can drink gallons of water. Have you seen people with, it's like a jerry can that they carry around with them, those big bottles. I can't do it. Lord, help me. <laughs> but none of us can drink a river of water. None of us can take in so much. I want you to show you what God does. It says, if you drink what I give you, 
it will become a fountain within you. You will never thirst again and rivers of living water will flow out of you. That little flow of mine, that little trickle, that little, little bit that seems so insignificant, if you will drink of the water of life, it will become a river. How? How can a little bit, how can a sip, how can a mouthful of the water of God turn everything into a river? I don't know. But he does it. Won't he do it? He who promised is faithful. Hallelujah. Now look what happens. So the little flow, the little insignificant, the hard to notice, little trickle turns into a river. But see, its purpose is fixed. It is not a random river. The water doesn't just run where it wants to. Let's see what happens. The water flows. In verse eight, toward the east, and it goes down into the valley, and it enters the sea, and when it reaches the sea, the sea is healed. Now, maybe you don't understand this. Let me tell you what happens here. The Dead Sea, I've been there. Nothing grows there. The borders around the sea, there's nothing. There's not a plant, there's, there's no grass, there's not a tree. In the water, I've been in the water. There's nothing. Not one fish, not one nothing. No plants, no animals, no fish. There's not even birds in the air because they know there's nothing to be found in those waters. The water is six times more salty than our ocean. You can float on it, even when you're a little bit heavier than you should be, like me now. <laughs> you can float. But did you know the most interesting thing about the Dead Sea? It covers the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not just speaking about death in the water. It's saying everything under here. See, the degradation of humanity, the sin, the rebellion, the hatred, the racism, the spirit of separation is operating there. It has killed everything. Nothing can live there. But this is the good news, that when the water touches the Dead Sea, when the water touches, touches, the sick water, the dead water, the water that covers all the darkness of our human existence. It says that life comes as it goes. It is healing. There is a healing river that heals of sin, that heals of separation, that heals of the sickness of humanity, the sickness of our nature, the sickness of our hearts, the sickness of our minds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And maybe in our nation, we only see a little trickle. But if we will lay a hold of this prophetic word, if we will lay a hold of this promise, we will say, as it is written, that the little flow will become a flood, that the little trickle will turn into a river, that there is a river of healing for our nation. And the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, destroyed for their depravity, will become a place of healing. Hallelujah. Now look at verse nine. It gets better, it gets better, it gets better. How's it possible? This is our God. It says, and it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. There will be a great multitude of fish because the waters go there, they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. Now remember, Jesus is the source, but he says, I'm the model for you. Wherever I go, there is healing, but that implies to us, wherever we go, there is healing. Wherever we go, sin should cease to be. Wherever we go, separation should come to an end. Wherever we go, healing should come to dead places. Places where nothing lives. Places where it's impossible. Places where it is absolutely beyond reason. Dead families, dead communities, dead nations, dead ec economies. There is a healing flow. There is a river. And it is inside of everyone who would believe. It says there will be fishermen on its shores. They will have place to spread their nets because the fish will be exceedingly many. There is a 
river that will turn the dead place into a place of harvest. Praise Jesus. It's a river of salvation. It's a river of salvation. It's a river of exceedingly many fish. Hallelujah. It will heal the water so that the fish have a place to live and prosper and multiply. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's go to verse 12, our last verse from this passage today. And it says, and along the banks of the river, hallelujah, (laughs) along the banks, every side of it, everywhere it touches, where it then runs to ground, it says, there will grow all kinds of trees, all kinds. Look around you today. We are all kinds. All kinds, all kinds, every culture, every race, every color, every tongue, every tribe, every class, all could be a tree if you will allow the river to flow. It says, yeah, is what these trees are good for. Their leaves will not wither. Their fruit will not fail. Listen to this. There will be fruit every month. (laughs) That's unnatural. I have a lemon tree in my garden. It doesn't bear fruit every month. It has a season, once a year where it will bring forth fruit. But the word of the Lord says to you, in season and out of season, and in season and out of season. You will be a tree planted by living waters, and you will bring forth fruit in every season. There'll be a prosperity. There'll be a provision. There'll be a place of healing, of nurture. And it says that the fruit will be there every month and the leaves will be medicine for the broken. The leaves will be medicine. Our lives will be medicine for the rape victim, for the abused wife, for the child who has no parents, for the one who is living in abject poverty, who has no hope. God says, you, my tree, you, my tree, you, my planting of righteousness, you are the one that I have positioned in this river to be medicine to this broken nation, to be medicine to every broken heart, to be medicine that the blind eye may see and the deaf ear may hear and the oppressed may experience liberty and freedom and know the acceptable hear of the Lord. Yes, your fruit is for food and your leaves for shade, but also for the healing of the broken, medicine to the world. Hallelujah. Isn't he awesome? Isn't he great? Hallelujah. There is a river. And it may have started as a little flow, but if you will be faithful in holding firm to the promise, it will increase. It will multiply. It will take you to a depth that you cannot measure, that you cannot understand, that is unstoppable, that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. There is a river. It comes from the temple of God. It flows from the heart of the Savior. There is a river, and it is inside of everyone who have drank from the living waters that is our God. Hallelujah. Our nation needs medicine. Our nation needs shade for the harsh conditions that people are living in. Our nation needs fruit so that they may eat and not be hungry and starving for life. Hallelujah. And the Lord is looking at you and he's saying, it is in you. If you have received Christ, it is in you. As it flows from him, it must flow from you. That flow on Calvary began something. It began something. On that day, he was the only temple. Look at us. We are multiplied thousands of temples of the Holy Spirit. 
No longer is the gospel a little trickle, but in our nation, there is a river. Hallelujah. We need to step into this prophetic word and say, Father, wherever I go, there'll be fruit, there'll be shelter, there'll be shade, there'll be medicine, there'll be a river. My life will testify to the power of God. My life will speak to the saving grace of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is time, it is time, it is time to see the change that was prophesied. If we saw the other prophecies, why should we not see this? If we saw God fulfill every other word, why not this? By grace. It is our portion by grace. Hallelujah. Will you stand to your feet as I read to you my closing scripture from Revelation 22. Jesus speaks. He says, behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha, the Omega. I'm the beginning, I'm the end. I'm the first, I am the last. Blessed are those who do my commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. And so the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts, come. Let whoever desires take of this water of life freely, come. Hallelujah. I believe it is a season where the flow must turn into a flood. God is calling us. There's significance in the beginning but we cannot remain at the beginning. We have to move with this river. We have to increase in the flows until there's a flood of life and hope and peace and reconciliation and healing and restoration from each of us everywhere we go every day. Hallelujah. I wanna to read to you Isaiah 61 verse three, which, which speaks about to console, to console those who mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And I want to ask how many of us have come into the service today and maybe there's a spirit of heaviness. Maybe your life feels like ashes, everything's burnt up, everything's destroyed. And I want to tell you, you've come here today into the presence of God where maybe your mourning, He says, I'll give you the oil of joy in place of your mourning. And he says, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. As you think about this today, I want you to think about that picture from Ezekiel, which is a similar picture to one that is given in Revelation of the New Jerusalem, where the tree that has a fruit to be eaten and the leaves are for the healing of the nation. And they, for the healing of the nation every single month. It never runs out. There's no winter. There's no winter in God. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're facing. It doesn't matter what you're going through. There is no winter in God. And the Lord wants to touch you because he wants your, His presence to be all over you. And He wants to transform your life. And He wants to fill you to the brim that there will be so much water inside of you that out of you will flow rivers of living water. But He's got to heal you first. And so when you come and you come before the Lord and <clears throat> maybe there's a spirit of Heaviness, maybe there's a spirit of anxiety, maybe there's a spirit of depression, maybe there's anger, maybe there's wrath, maybe you're just heartbroken, maybe like one of the guys on security told me, you're an all black supporter. Amen. You supported New Zealand, now you're sad. Maybe you just chose the wrong team. 
Amen. But whether it's you who chose the wrong team or things happened outside of your control, maybe someone left you that you thought was ever, always going to be around. Maybe someone died that you never expected to lose now. Maybe you just don't seem to be financially okay. I want you to look at where you are right now and I want you to close your eyes. <clears throat> Maybe you've come in your heart broken. Something has happened, you're heartbroken. And I want you to think about the picture from the text verse where as they pierced him in the side, they pierced Jesus in the side, the Bible says blood and water flowed. And the blood and water flowed so that he can heal you of a broken heart. When that blood gets applied to your broken heart, you will be healed. You will be restored. And I want you to picture your circumstance, your situation. And Jesus knows what you're going through. <clears throat> he knows your pain. People around you may not know your pain, but Jesus knows your pain. I know this because he knows my pain. Maybe your brokenness is because your character is just not up to it. Maybe you know that the problem is you just can't be faithful to people that you say you love. Maybe your problem is that you just can't be faithful to people that, are, that you're in business with. Maybe it's just character issues. Maybe you can't be nice to the people in your home. You find yourself lashing out to people you love and you can't stop yourself. And I want you to realize today that whatever the situation may be, the blood and the water flowed so that Jesus could bring restoration to your soul. That he could bring restoration to your life. And maybe you're just here yeah, and you want to change. You've been trying to change, but you can't change. You can only change by Jesus. You've heard in the word this morning. It's not something that you can do. And some of you, you've been trying hard in your own strength to, to do it. And the reality is you can't. It has to be done in partnership with the Lord. You have to partner the Lord. You have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. You have to take in the word. And you have to be willing to, to make a commitment to him. And so I want to ask you today. If either there's something that needs to be restored in your life. There's something missing. Maybe you realize that <clears throat> the rivers are not flowing out of you. People are not being touched by your glory. That comes, the, the Lord's glory, so it comes to you. If there's any challenge in regard to where you are anything that the Lord has ministered to you right now and he's calling you to come back to him whether you've never given your life to Jesus whether you've given your life to Jesus and you need to recommit your life to Jesus or whether the Lord has spoken to you today and you're needing to open your heart up to him you're needing to go to a new level with Him. Maybe just the level of your relationship with the Lord hasn't been what it should be. And if that is you, I'm going to invite you right now to come from where you are, to take your possessions with you and come stand here in the front. Can we give a big round of applause? People are coming. There are more of us that need to come. There are more of us that need to come. 
And what I want you to listen to is Psalm 1 verse 3. If you will come, and some of you are not coming, and listen to what you're missing out on. They that will come to the Lord in Psalm 1 verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Maybe you're just feeling today that what you're doing is not prospering. If what you're doing is not prospering, I want to invite you to come forward and to lift your hands up to the Lord and just sacrifice to Him. And I just want to ask, there's one or two others, you need to come forward. You've been frustrated. Just come forward right now. And don't worry what anyone will think. Because this is you and the Lord. Is there anyone else? And now as you're standing here, I want you to listen to the words again that Pastor Shana ended with here. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. <clears throat> Notice it's according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates of the, into the city. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water freely. The Lord is calling you today to take his water freely. And maybe there's someone else here today. You've realized in this moment, you're suddenly realizing, gee, I'm thirsty. And it's not a physical thirst. It's a spiritual thirst. And just come join those that are in the front if that is you. And I want everyone to close your eyes and I want you to remember, you know, with times like this, that our eternal destiny is at stake. And don't struggle against the Lord now because what you're doing as you've come forward, you're saying, Lord, I want to commit to you now because I want to submit my life completely to you due to the fact that you do better with my life than I do. Right, and, and I want you to think about that. Maybe the Lord has spoken to you before and you've always wanted to do your own thing in your life. One, one of the things I hear people say, why do we have to, you know, in relation to church? There's nothing you have to do. You don't have to go to heaven either. You can freely go to hell. You don't have to drink of the water of the river of life. You don't have to drink of all that Jesus has given you you don't have to drink you're full of the Holy Spirit you don't have to you can be thirsty I grant you today the right to be thirsty I grant you the right to be empty on the inside I grant you the right to have all kinds of issues going on in your head people have billions of issues so many issues that if we could convert, imagine if we could convert the issue in every head in South Africa into money. This country would have so much money that the United Nations would be begging us for money. There's one thing that we can export is issues. And then what happens is you don't have to get over those issues. Because everything we're talking about is what you need to do. And it, yes, yeah, I'm going to say it. It's what you have to do if you want to get over the issues. If you want to stay with your issues, then stay with your issues. But if you want to get over them, then you have to. And you have to do what you don't want to do. Because something in you doesn't want to get over your issues. And you have to get over your pride. You have to get over your thought to say, my issues are bigger than anyone else's. 
And people must just accept that I've got an issue that no one else can help. You know, everyone thinks that. If you think that your issue is the one that people must just understand because they don't understand because your issue is bigger than anyone else's, everyone thinks their issues are bigger than everyone else's. Because we're full of pride. And right now, what the Lord is saying, He's saying to you, I want you to drop your issues. I want you to take a step of faith and drop that desire for justice. I want you to take a step of faith and drop that security that you have in having an issue. The Lord is saying, I want you to drop the anger and the bitterness. I want you to drop your depression. I want you to drop your anxiety. I want you to drop your panic attacks. I want you to drop whatever it is that is going on. I want you to drop your drugs. I want you to drop your alcohol. The Lord is saying to you, I want you to drop everything that is, 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 is related to your issues. Because your issues are killing you. And that's why you submit your life completely to God. And if you want to experience the joy of the Lord, yes, then you have to. You have to do a devotion. You have to come on encounter. You have to come to church. You have to be in a cell. Yes, you have to. It's like I'm married. I have to talk to my wife. Imagine if I'm complaining, why do I have to talk to my wife? Imagine how pathetic that would be. I put a ring on her finger. She committed her entire life to me. And now I say, do I have to talk to her? Do I have to take her out on a date? Do I have to? The answer is, if you want a happy wife, you better. Yes, you have to. If you care about her, yes, you have to. And the love that you have for her will force you to. And so I'm asking if there's anyone else here. You haven't submitted to the Lord because I feel there are one or two. And you've come, been coming with a thing. Why do I have to? And the Lord is saying, well, if you want my joy, you have to submit to me. If you want to continue the rest of your life with your issues, and if you want people to feel sorry for you, then fine. Please don't come forward. That's what the Lord's saying. Because some people want to have issues because they like having people feeling sorry for them. But he's saying, if you want everything that I have for you, if you want this water that will start out ankle deep and go knee and eventually you'll be swimming in the river of, the, of, of God, then you have to submit to him. And you're saying, I can't wait until I get home. You're saying to yourself, if I wait until I get home, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I have to do this now because, Lord, I have to do it because I don't want to live eternity away from you. I don't want to live forever without you. I want to live close to you from today. I want to live close to you so that whenever death comes knocking, that it won't affect me because I'll know that I'll know that I'll know that I'm living with you for eternity. And so I'm going to ask you to put your right hand on your heart. And as we put our right hands on, on, on our hearts, if anyone else needs to come forward, just come forward. Just come forward as I'm painting this picture. Come forward while you're painting it in your mind. And I want you to visualize Jesus. Remembering that he died on the cross for you. The Bible says that this Jesus who died on the cross for you is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Jesus that Pastor Shonai was talking about. He's the temple that Pastor Shonai was talking about. He, he wants to turn you into a temple of the Holy Spirit. And this Jesus who died on the cross for you over 2,000 years ago, His work stands once and for all. The blood of Jesus is the price that He paid. His shed blood was the price that He paid to take our sins away. His shed blood was the price that He paid 
to cancel all debts we have before, mighty God, because of our sin. And I want you to see yourself being set free right now. See the debt before God being set free. It's being taken away from you right now. You've been given complete freedom right now. The joy of the Lord is being poured into your heart right now. Come on, believe it. There's some of you that have come forward yeah, You need to believe it. Amen. People think it's cool to walk around without joy. To walk around feeling sorry for themselves. It's a fashion. And you need to drop the fashion. And you need to say, Lord, I'm going to allow you to do this. I'm going to allow you to wash my issues away. Because when you wash my sin away, you wash my issues away. And I just want to tell you this morning, and I'm feeling very strongly that I need to say this. You know when we have issues, the source of our issues is sin. And you know it's exactly the same in the spiritual as it is in the physical. You, you take someone into a hospital, and I want you to listen to me today. You take someone into a hospital, and they've got a high fever. It means there's an infection in their bodies. And all they can do is they can control the symptoms until they find out the source. What is it that's causing the fever? What is it that's causing the infection? Until they find that thing, the infection remains and the fevers will come back. They will come back in waves. Once they find the infection, they can take the, 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 the source of the infection out and, and you can be made well. It's exactly the same in the spiritual. When you have issues, there's a source of the infection and the source is related to sin. Every one of our issues is sin. There's a sin and we've bought into it. And I don't know why I'm speaking so strongly about this today. Because some of us need to hear this. And when we drop it and we throw our arms open to Jesus he changes us and when you change everything around you will change some of you need to stop drugs today some of you you need to drop the drugs some of you took drugs this morning you need to drop it you're not going to get with God the, the devil has a hold of you with those drugs and so I want you to repeat after me as we pray. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I repent of everything that I've done wrong. I renounce my life of sin. And I accept your sacrifice. And I know that it was the price that you paid for my redemption. And today, Lord, I ask that the blood of your wounded body would wash me of all my rebellion, all my sin. And that you'd set me free from any sickness and any pain. Lord, whether it be physical, Lord, be emotional, emotional, or spiritual. Or spiritual. And, I and I accept that my debt has been paid. There is no outstanding balance. Is no outstanding you, paid balance. you paid everything for me on the cross of Calvary. The cross of Calvary. And, I and I accept that by your blood, I am justified. And you see me as I've never sinned. And by your blood, I am sanctified. And you have chosen me to serve you. And I'm willing to serve you. And so I open the door of my heart. And I invite you to come in. As my Lord and my Savior. I thank you for saving me. And for giving me eternal life. In Jesus name. Amen. Join us for our annual G12 Africa Conference at the Moraletta Church in Twane on the 23rd and 24th of February 2024. Visit www.my3c.tv and get registered today.